Hello and welcome to Percontation Points Video Snark. I read bad books so that you don't have to. I'm continuing my review of Shatter Me by Tahereh Mafi. At the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 21. The chapter starts off with Juliet expressing how she can kill time, except that it's written in that baffling purple prose aesthetic that the author favors that's really confusing. I've reached the point where I'm not even going to waste my time struggling to understand what any of this means, so let's move on. Warner actively forbids Juliet from talking to anybody outside of himself, which... Okay? Why not? One abusive, manipulative boyfriend trope coming up. I know he's technically not her boyfriend, but I was wondering the other day if the book isn't trying to turn Warner into the other end of a love triangle, especially because he's, one, around Juliet's age, and two, literally the only other character outside of Juliet and Adam. However, despite being unable to talk to Adam, he still sleeps in her room every single night. Juliet feels like she's going crazy, like she imagined her last conversation with Adam, but they're being watched so closely. Warner refuses to take the cameras out from Juliet's room, though despite her protests. This prompts Juliet to randomly think about a little boy she once accidentally killed at the grocery store. He'd been literally leashed to his mother, and the mother kept saying all these really cruel and mean things towards him. Juliet literally thought that she was helping the boy. Which, there are literally no words to describe what I'm feeling right now. Juliet saw what was probably something difficult to watch, but rather than to, oh, I don't know, try to get help for the little boy in some way, her immediate response was murder. This, this is why it is that I keep circling back to how are we supposed to be rooting for either side when nobody has told us what either side stands for? Because let's look at what we've got right now. On side A, we have opulence that a literal baby murderer says could go towards food and water, and mentions of pork burning, and that's about it. On side B, we have literal baby murder. It's gotten to the point until the book finally decides to stop giving us endless adjectives and get to the point of what Warner's actual endgame is, I'm gonna agree with anything he says, including keeping Juliet hostage because she's clearly a danger to society. However, Warner's refusal and reminder of the baby she killed only just makes her insanely angry. She says that she's going to fight him about this. He gets a side and says that they're finally starting to make progress. Juliet refuses to work with him and threatens to find and destroy every camera even though that's a giant bluff on her part. Warner eventually agrees to remove the cameras only on the condition that Juliet touch him. She refuses, which girl. I know that she's swimming in guilt over all the people she's hurt, but at the same time, I don't have any sympathy for her for not just flat out killing the guy and running away. He is literally holding her prisoner, and she's refusing to lift a finger to help herself. I convinced my father that you would be an asset to the reestablishment, that you'd be able to restrain any rebels. We... Did he just... <laughs> Did Warner just casually mention getting his father's permission to obtain Juliet. At this point, I'm legit surprised that Warner's not going around and stealing all of Draco Malfoy's lines. Anyway, Warner says that they plan on using Juliet to torture people. He brags about having rescued Juliet from the asylum when he admitted to her in, in an earlier chapter that he was the only reason why she was in, in there in the first place. Warner then keeps pressuring her and makes her doubt her own sanity, because he's nice like that, I guess. When Juliet continues to argue, he says that these people deserve it. Of course you are. You don't know it yet, Juliet, but you are a very bad girl, he said, clutching his heart. Just my type. Hmm, yeah, I can still support Warner's cause without actually liking Warner. He's kind of a piece of work. Neither of these people are winners, in my opinion. He then starts to talk about Adam sleeping in Juliet's room and asks her if Adam makes her uncomfortable, which, um, getting some intense Hunger Games vibes here with how obsessed with Keita and Katniss that President Snow was. Warner then goes on to say that Adam remembers her, that he volunteered because they once went to school together. He continues to go Julia with this info until she randomly gives in and agrees to touch him. However, just as she's about to do so, she double checks that he'll remove the cameras and microphones and the bugs, and he kind of indicates that he doesn't plan on doing that. It's enough to make her hesitate, pull back. Julia goes to the door where she sees Adam and assumes that he heard everything, and again with her magical Mary Sue guessing powers. Ugh. She thinks that Adam now thinks that she's a monster and will hate her. Warner tells Adam to take Juliet back to her room and to disable all of the cameras. Chapter 22 We open on yet another exaggerated metaphor. 
It takes five years to walk to the elevator, 15 more to ride it up. I'm a million years old by the time I walk into my room. I'm getting really sick and tired of these. Adam and Juliet go back to Juliet's room where Adam starts to remove all of the cameras on Warner's order. Juliet then flashes back to when she was in third grade. Because of her condition, her parents are constantly moving to try and escape from whatever Juliet had last done. Also worth noting that never once has anybody ever mentioned Juliet getting into a program so that she can, oh, I don't know, stop killing people with her murder skin? This was back before society started to get bad. Which, if all of this destruction happened in the span of less than a decade, it's little wonder that society is on the brink of collapse. Honestly, society probably deserved it. Anyway, Adam was this boy in her class, but this we already knew. What we didn't know were any other details about Julia's time being Adam's classmate. He was poor, always in bad clothing, and never had any food. Juliet saw Adam's father once, a mean drunk who first shoved Adam out from the car, then hit Adam until he collapsed into the ground and then started to kick him on the school grounds. And if Juliet saw something, tells me that there were other witnesses. Child Protective Services? <laughs> What's that? Literally not even a teacher trying to help Adam? Again, what is that? People literally saw Adam's dad beat Adam until he was on the ground and they literally did nothing. I don't know what happened to society, but again, they probably deserved it. Back in the present, Juliet confirms with Adam that he remembers her from when they were classmates so many years earlier. Adam agrees and says that he thought that the rumors going around his school about Juliet were just kids being mean. They'd heard about Juliet having murdered the baby from the previous chapter and said unkind things about her. But Adam hearing Warner talking about it with Juliet... Juliet tries to defend herself, says that it was only an accident that the baby had fallen, but she was just trying to help. And I do suppose that it does help soften the blow by, like, one point. How the heck did she forget that she has murder skin? Adam says that he believes her because... Okay, here's where the book lost me. He believes her because he was in the class with her and he wanted to be her friend? It's really unclear and also really bad. Why does he believe her simply because of a two-second relationship when they were eight? Juliet says that she remembers him if only because he was nice to her. And I get where Juliet is coming from. If only because when kids are literally throwing rocks at you and calling you mean things, the one kid who isn't kind of sticks out. Juliet goes so far as to call Adam her only friend. It's Adam's weird obsession over Juliet after all this time that I'm still hung up over. With Juliet's confession over having remembered Adam, he pulls her against him and kisses her neck for a while. Just as they're about to lock lips, somebody uses what I'm going to assume is the room's intercom system to ask why all of the cameras are down. Adam has to explain that Warner asked for him to remove the cameras, but the person mentions punishment. However, considering the way that Warner was acting in the previous chapter, I'm going to go ahead and assume that he's going to deny having given Adam permission to remove the cameras, just as an excuse to torture Adam, if only to get to Juliet. Adam turns back to Juliet and tells her that they need to get out of there. Chapter 23 The book finally decides to establish that Juliet and Adam knew each other for longer than my earlier guesstimate of two seconds when they were eight. That despite Juliet having established that her family moved around to escape Juliet's past, they apparently stayed in this area long enough for Juliet to have been in the school with Adam for six years. She goes on to say that they stayed with each other, not really talking, but Adam helped to chase the other kids away. He himself was picked on a lot probably because of his family's poverty. And for some reason, despite all of that, Juliet was under the impression that Adam wouldn't remember who she was. And then I'm circling back to the bad, big, and confusing writing because I guess the incident with the baby Juliet murdered happened right around then, rather than the fact that it was why Juliet had to move, because she touched the baby and killed him. Oh, but she says that it had been so long since she had last done it, and I get it. But what I don't get is why it is that the parents weren't drilling it into her head that her touch literally kills people. The author is so quick to paint Juliet's parents as these terrible people, but somehow miss the opportunity to be constantly reminding Juliet of what she can do. It wasn't until after this incident that Juliet was then subjected to all of the government experimentations and locked up, which anything that she did couldn't possibly have been that bad if the government had stepped in and locked her away. Up until Adam shows up in her cell, she hadn't seen him in three years. He'd obviously changed, but a big part of her hadn't wanted to remember anything from before three years ago because of all the horrible things she went through. 
Some other guards randomly knock on Juliet's door and ask to see her. Adam chews them out and says that she's not some animal in a zoo. After they're alone again, the two of them stare at the window for a moment. Adam asks her how she is, and she says that people usually don't care about how she's doing. Adam asks if she's sure about leaving, which, buddy, leaving was all your idea. He goes on to say that the troops are mobilizing for some sort of a battle, and while everybody is distracted with the attack, the two of them will use it to slip away. Julia asks Adam if he would really go away with her. She's baffled by his enthusiastic agreement over going anywhere with her. He then randomly tells her these stories he remembers from when they were in school together of their other classmates taking advantage of Julia's good nature and kindness only to turn around and treat her like garbage. He says a lot of words, but what it basically boils down to is that she's so nice and he's kind of in love with her. Adam continues on and says that the mob is about at their boiling point. He gives them three weeks before the troops won't be able to hold them back. Julia doesn't say much, but it's pretty obvious that three weeks like this is a lifetime. Chapter 24. The author must be bored with her own story because then we skip two weeks. Which, good, let's move this along, shall we? The fortnight is spent with more of the same of her pretending to be Warner's trophy, if only because she knows that the first chance she'll get, she'll run off and hopefully never see him again. Warner treats her like a friend, a confidant, telling her stories of his own terrible father. This is done under the assumption that they'll bond because of their terrible parents. Julia understands to some degree, but also doesn't want to be anything like him at all. Adam talks about how obsessed with Juliet that Warner is. His involvement with this group began when he heard rumors of them looking for a girl named Juliet who had killed a little boy at a grocery store. He volunteered and was quickly picked up simply because of his background with Juliet. However, just because Warner agreed to turn the cameras off in Juliet's room doesn't mean that he's giving her any privacy. He's constantly barging into her room and demanding her presence at all times. Adam says that he's becoming unhinged. One day, Warner gives Juliet some different clues to her. She describes them as being a tiny tank top and even shorter shorts, so tiny she might as well be wearing nothing. As they leave the room, Warner dismisses Adam, who is standing guard by the door. Juliet then realizes why it is that Warner trusts Adam so much, because in Warner's mind, Adam is just this nameless, faceless cardboard cutout of a soldier. He's interchangeable with literally any other soldier on the base. Warner takes Juliet deeper into the compound than she's ever been and locks her in a room. Over an intercom system, Warner tells Juliet that he disabled the cameras in her room and now it's time for her to hold up her end of the deal. Juliet refuses to touch him, but he laughs and says that he's sending in a proxy. A literal baby is then sent into the room and Warner says that even if Juliet doesn't touch the baby, that they're going to kill him anyway. And just like that, I'm back on being Team Juliet and Adam. Juliet might have murdered the baby at the grocery store, but she did it because she saw the baby with the abusive mother as a proxy for herself. Warner's having Juliet kill a baby simply because he owns Juliet. Thanks for listening to my book snark on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because sometimes I drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to support me. The first is watching this video as well as all of my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already cut up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. And if you've already read all of my main snarks, then you can find even more snarks on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Plus, you also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Dawn, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snark so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $3 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well. $3 for every 5,000 words. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and one full-length novel. I also sometimes run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do that just so you know when I might be offering more things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys.